My guest tonight is a trailblazer, and that too in cyberspace. It's one of the greatest internet success stories. A Bangalore whiz kid who revolutionized the net and became a new age millionaire. Enviable, inspirational. He is the co-founder of Hotmail, Sabir Bhatia. Hi, Sabir. Hi, Simi. You know, I followed your cyber track, and it is so nice to finally meet you. Thank you for coming on my show. No, it certainly has been my pleasure to be on the show. You know, as co-founder of Hotmail, your success story has been repeated, recycled, reinvented, till it's almost become folklore. But tonight, I want to hear it from the man himself. Okay? Absolutely. Tell me, Sabir, were your dreams money? Or were your dreams invention? Well, it was really to be famous. The short answer to your question is it was, it was more fame than fortune. What sort of fame were you looking for? Why? I was really looking to be remembered for having done something. And ever since my early childhood days, I was looking at becoming something that would bring me fame. Uh, not so much fortune. You could have been a movie star. I could have, but um, I didn't know how to go about doing it, for <laughs> one. You know, having been brought up in an army background, yes. I was very deeply influenced by my parents, by my father. So when I was very, very young, I wanted to be a general in the army. In fact, I would go around telling all my friends not to call me Sabir, but to call me General P2 Bhatia. <laughs> and P2 because we lived in a place that used to be you know, P2 Pioneer Lines. Okay, General Bhatia. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds strange, but it's the truth. Well, for someone who didn't want fortune, at last count, you're worth some $400 million, which today makes you into a 1,800 times crorepati. Not just a crorepati, but 1,800 <laughs> times. I mean, that, that's huge money. That is, yeah, it certainly is anywhere in the world. And you're only 32? That's also correct. Then let me take you back to when you were 19, September 1988, when a young 19-year-old Sabir arrived from Bangalore at Los Angeles Airport. What was it like? I, uh, I didn't know what to expect because you have to realize I was transplanted hmm. from an environment where I had a number of friends to, to a brand new country where uh, it was hard for me to even converse with some of the people. Why? Because of my accent. Uh, it was very hard. Like how? People couldn't understand what I was saying, and I had to always repeat myself and speak a lot slower. I mean, even though both, both uh, parties spoke English, uh, mine was very Indian, right? It was with an Indian accent, mm. and I was extremely homesick. And I would write almost every week, and and uh, I wanted to cry, but I couldn't. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't tell my parents, hey, take me back, and you know, I, I want to go back. But I said, hey, let me give this a shot, and let me see where it takes me. But you were always a brilliant student, weren't you? That's correct, yeah. I was fortunate enough to, 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 to be smart. You got your bachelor's and uh, your master's from Caltech and Stanford. That's correct. And then you took a job with Apple Computers. Mm -hmm. It's pretty regular stuff. Yeah, absolutely. How then did you hit upon the idea that would change your life and revolutionize the internet forever? I think the real seeds for the idea were sown at Stanford. In fact, Silicon Valley was started by two students from Stanford. Stanford. Okay. That is Hewlett and Packard. And that's what really started mm. this entire entrepreneurial revolution mm. of the past 30, 40 years. Companies such as Apple Computer and Sun Microsystems would come and tell us their stories. And that inspired me. I'm like, wow, if they can go and create such great companies. Why can't I? Why can't I? So when I joined Apple Computer, and I, of course, befriended my partner and colleague, Jack Smith, mm -hmm. who co-founded Hotmail with me, 
I would walk up to him and tell him, look at this, somebody else has started a company and sold their company for five million. And at that time, five million was a lot of money. I'm like, these guys are only 29 years old and they've sold their company for five million. I mean, and like every other India would convert it to rupees and say, <laughs> by God, that's 20 crores. I can't even imagine what it means to be a, a crore pati yeah. at that time. But when you arrived in America, were you computer savvy? Not at all. In fact, I will tell you, I had hardly used a computer. And by the time I was at Apple Computer, I had learned all that there was to learn about computers. So how did you get that idea? So I started thinking, what can we do no. on the internet? What can I do? No. And then I went and recruited Jack. Mm -hmm. And then the two of us started work on this idea together. But you couldn't communicate with each other privately, could you? That's exactly how the idea for Hotmail was born. Our company, you know, restricted access to our personal email accounts while we were at work. With a firewall? With a firewall. Okay. And that's when it occurred to us, wait a minute, we can access any website in the world through this web browser. Yes. So what if we could access our email through that web browser too? And that was the idea. We're like, wow, it will solve our problem. Yes. And that's when he said, wait a minute. If it will solve our problem, it will solve the problem of many others. So he said, great, we've got to start a company doing this. How do we make money off of this? He said, look at Netscape. They gave the browser away for free. Yeah. And that's why they became so big. So we decided, all right, we'll give our email away for free. And that is how Hotmail was really born. How did you, an unknown Indian, raise money? Oh, it was really difficult. Yeah. Both Jack and myself were only 27 years old. Did anyone take you seriously? Uh, at first, no. But anyone who had anything to do with like money or had money, I would show up with a suit and tie <laughs> and a business plan in hand. So we went through 19 different, you know, so-called investors. And luckily, you know, the 20th venture capitalist, he decided to listen to us. And they said, so how much money do you need, Sabir? So I said, well, um, I need actually three million to pull this off. He said, no, 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 time out here. Tell us how much money do you need just to prove to us that you can do this? So I said, um, half a million dollars. They said, we'll give you 300,000. And I said, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we really started. So then how did you think of Hotmail? Hotmail. Um, Hotmail actually stands for HTML. That's the language. That you put on the web. Yeah, that's right. So we came up with like 20 different names. Hypermail, Blazemail, Fastmail, Supermail, all kinds of mail combinations. And Hotmail just stood out. Wasn't it embarrassing sometimes? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> It was, at first when I would call like other companies, inevitably their secretaries would pick up the phone and they're like, uh, excuse me, which company are you with? I'm like, with Hotmail. <laughs> and they would like start giggling and I'm like, oh my God, it's not M-A-L-E, it's M-A-I-L. <laughs> they're like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Let me put you through. So on, on, on July 4th, 1996, you launched Hotmail. Mm -hmm. Such is the power of the net that within an hour, you had a hundred subscribers? Yes, every hour we had an ac accurate count. And within five months, you had your millionth uh, subscriber? Within six months, we had a million subscribers. And I had predicted that, and every VC I had told that to said, you know, Sabir, we trust you, we believe in you, but you might want to tone down this, <laughs> this wild optimism about your service. I mean, we believe in you, but you might want to be a little more realistic in your <laughs> business plan. I'm like, no, I truly believe that. And I proved them wrong. And then within a year, you got the call that every Silicon Valley entrepreneur dreams of. Bill Gates wants to buy your company. I got a call from Microsoft. It was more like, hmm, you guys, are you for serious? Are you for real? You claim to have six to seven million subscribers. Um, is that right? And I'm like, yeah, that's absolutely right. And then my partner, Jack, and myself were flown to, to Microsoft headquarters to meet with Bill Gates.
The big daddy himself. It was an experience. Oh my God. We are going to meet with Bill Gates. And two of us were like, not only are we going to meet like the king of all software, but the, mo the richest and possibly the most powerful man in the world. And so, you know, we were taken there. We were shown all the buildings of Microsoft and we were told this building houses like, you know, 2,000 people and all it does is Microsoft Office. Oh. This building houses 5,000 people and all it does is Microsoft Exchange email. And there were 25,000 people and 26 buildings. And here I was running a company of 60 people and like, you know, <laughs> not even one building, <laughs> half a building. <laughs> so for me, it was, you know, incredibly intimidating. Yeah. And then we were taken <laughs> and into, you know, Bill Gates' office. Then what happened? Bill was quiet. He just introduced himself and, and looked at me and then he started looking everywhere else but at me. I'm like, and that was very unnerving yes. because I'm talking to you. You look at me, but he looked everywhere. Maybe it was a tactic to intimidate me. So I was even more nervous. So then I was told, um, tell us more about your company. And I started like, okay, uh, we came up with the idea. The idea of Hotmail is to do blah, blah, blah. And, you know, continued doing that. And he still didn't look at me, but somehow I, I knew it was a tactic. So I just continued. And then he interrupted me and started asking me questions. And once he started doing that, I felt completely at ease because I had done that before. Yeah. I knew it, you know, like the back of my hand. And then they offered you 140 million. 140 million. And you got back with what figure? Right, I got back to them at, uh, with 750 million. <laughs> did they sort of swallow <laughs> to a double take? So exactly. Did they think you're nuts? What did they say? <laughs> they, they said I was crazy. <laughs> they said I was out of my mind to even think of you know, valuing a company that was live on the internet for only a little more than a year. Totally. They came up to 200, 250. You stuck to your guns. You were cool. Yeah, I was cool. Uh, when, when we were offered 350 million for the company, uh, I actually turned it down. And everybody in the company was mad at me. Like, sure. severe. This is your responsibility. If this deal does not work out, it is you who are to blame. And then uh, for a week, a number of employees would walk up to me and said, Sabir, I really think you should sell because look, this can buy us our retirement. It'll buy me the house that I was always looking for. And I was under incredible pressure. So I called up my parents and I told them, you know, mm -hmm. so they said, so what's going on? I'm like, well, there's this, uh, they've offered us money and we've, uh, I've kind of turned that down. So my dad says, how much? So I said, uh, 350. There was like silence for two minutes. Says, you call up Bill Gates right now. <laughs> Give him a call. Give me his number. <laughs> Do you know how many zeros that is? <laughs> so I'm like, no, no, dad, don't worry about it. You know, I, I know exactly what I'm doing. It's like, oh my God, our son has gone crazy over here. <laughs> he has no idea what he's turning away. <laughs> it could have gone all wrong. And for a week, I thought it, I had made the biggest mistake mm -hmm. of my life. But tell me, where did you learn the art of bargaining? I just saw people bargaining. Uh, especially in India, you know, I would go with the orderly uh, to buy vegetables and our servants and stuff, I would see them haggling all the time. But that's it. That's it. But people say that you're nice and friendly till you sit down on that ne negotiating table. Then they say that some fierce, riveting aura sweeps over you and you become another person till it's almost scary. I don't think that happens all the time. I pick my deals wisely. <laughs> and I pick my fights wisely okay. and I pick my negotiations very wisely too. What is the trick and the secret to negotiating well? One is the ability to walk away from any deal. If you know that, you can negotiate as high as you possibly can go. Second is know your opponent really well. If you know their Achilles heel, if you know their weaknesses, you know how to get the best deal for yourself with Microsoft. They had been trying to perfect email for the longest time. So I knew that was their weakness and I knew they wanted me. It's just a question of assessing how much do you think the opponent really wants you. So in, on your birthday, on December the 30th, mm -hmm. 1997. That's right. They agreed to pay you $400 million. That's correct. They signed the paper. I bet you felt you could have got more. No, no. That was, 
I knew that was the maximum. The <laughs> Couldn't take the maximum. Any more, and I knew it was, it was the end of it. The date was signed. How did you feel? It, I literally pinched myself a hundred mm -hmm. times over. I was, I could not believe. I mean, I was walking around like I owned the world. <laughs> I owned the hotel. I owned everything. So when, when this deal was signed, who was the first person you called? My parents, of course. What did you say? I told them that we had signed the deal with Microsoft and... Um, you know, I was worth so many million dollars. What did they say? They didn't believe it. They, they could not believe it. They're like, are you sure? Is this for so much? They, they paid so much money. I'm like, yeah, that's what. I said, I can't even compute it on my calculator in <laughs> rupees. So, and this is true. Yeah. A week later, they called our family friends in the Bay Area, in the San mm. Francisco region, said, is this guy telling the truth? <laughs> She's ah, oh, don't worry about it. It is true. I mean, <laughs> they're like, <laughs> so then they call me back and so can we start spending the money now? Oh, sweet. <laughs> my parents, you know, my, my mom especially was questioned by her friends and she says, but Mrs. Bhatia, unne vechia ki, you know, in Punjabi, unne vechia ki, ki siga. But that's so na, ki siga, software siga, hardware siga. <laughs> So my mom would really try to explain and get, she at one time got so upset, she said, fruit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the typical Punjabi. But you have built a house, a beautiful house for your parents in Bangalore, haven't you? That's correct, yes. That's very nice. Oh, thank you. No, I always wanted them. They, my mom's dream was to really have like a bungalow. You know, she had mm. told me this, uh, you know, uh, when I was an engineer at Apple Computer, so I made it happen for her. That's lovely. But what else do you spend your money on? I mean, what are your extravagances? I've had a few. I've, I've splurged uh, in a few areas. I've bought myself a very nice apartment in San Francisco. Um, I bought myself a few fancy cars. Okay. I think what money affords me now is the luxury of buying anything that I really want to. Um, I don't ever have to think twice. If I go to a store, if I like something, I just buy it. I treat all my friends whenever I can. Uh, I take them out to restaurants and there's like a standing rule. Whenever anybody goes out to lunch or dinner with me, I pick up the tab. <laughs> but there's nothing that I really, really want to buy now. I mean, I've got everything that, you know, that any human can really want. And well, Onasa said, if women didn't exist, all the money in the world would have no meaning. I would completely agree with that. Well, then why are you a bachelor? Why are, aren't you married? Well, I'm still looking. I'm still Not looking. Not looking hard enough. I think in matters of the heart, sometimes it's the other way around. Love finds you, as opposed to you going out and trying to find the right person. And I want it to happen in a very, in a very proper, kind of natural way, right? Just fall in love with someone. So what is it that you're looking for? Somebody who's talented, somebody who's attractive, who's articulate, and someone like yourself, actually, um, you know, who's, with whom I can have a good conversation. Um, and somebody who's interesting, who can make me laugh. That's really important. Mm. And I don't want to get married because I'm getting older or because it's the ripe age. What does your mother have to say about this? Oh, she is really upset. She blames me for her unhappiness because I'm not married and I don't see the connection between the two. <laughs> but you know how Indian parents are. And she feels that she has failed in her responsibility because she has not found me the right wife or a wife. Would you like her to find you a wife? Are you going to find one yourself? No, no, I'm going to find one myself. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Okay. What, what were all these rumors about you and Aishwarya? Well, those were just rumors, as you said. How did it start? Why? We spent a very interesting evening together, which was mm -hmm. at the Miss India. India contest. And she was sitting right next to me. And, and for, there was a four-hour show. And in between uh, you know, performances, we had an opportunity to talk to each other. And I found her incredibly interesting. And incredibly beautiful. And incredibly beautiful. No question about that. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to keep in touch with her and, you know, asked her for a phone number and called her up a few times. 
Um, and then I think she changed her cell phone and I, we completely lost contact and that was the end of it. Oh, okay. Do you see Hindi films a lot? I do see Hindi movies, uh, not a lot. And who are your favorites? Um, I'd have to say Aishwarya is an incredibly talented actress. Uh, there is a running joke in San Francisco that the, the, the Tal CD is burnt into my music system because whenever any friends of mine show up, uh, they say, we'll go to Sabir's house on one condition, he doesn't play Tal anymore. <laughs> but the, the big question in any Silicon Valley debate today is, was Sabir a genius or was he just lucky? So what do you say, great or lucky? I cannot say that I was unlucky. Both Jack and myself went through a lot of hardship to put this together. We took a lot of risks. He had a family when we quit our jobs and decided we, we had to do this. So you can't say that all of this is luck. I think it's a bit of both. I mean, you know, both of us were incredibly smart to have thought of this idea and have to have, to have pulled it off. Yes. And we were incredibly lucky as well. Bill Gates doesn't believe in God or luck. He believes in hard work and competition. What about you? I believe in all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> and I also do believe that there is some force, and whether you call it God or just a supernatural force, that has been responsible for our existence. I mean, I truly believe in some sense that karma is true. And I must have done something really right in my <laughs> last life to be you know, so fortunate in this one. Do you find yourself praying? I do. I, um, uh, once a day, for a brief two minutes before I go to bed, uh, I just thank God for all that He's done for me. And I just pray to Him that uh, He gives me the strength to continue to do so. Well, with His grace, you seem to have, have it all, almost all. So I don't know what to wish you. I think I will wish you what you don't have. I'm going to wish you a perfect wife. <laughs> <laughs> My mom is going to love you. <laughs> Actually, your mom and I better get together. We have to find somebody for you. <laughs> thank you so much for a lovely evening, Sabir. No, thank you for inviting me. It was truly a pleasure of mine to be here tonight. Thank you for the promise.